everybody, Formula 2 returned after a slightly longer break than expected to the streets of Monte Carlo. There were a few near misses, a few overtakes, a lot of talking points from the weekend. This is the F2 Show, the official podcast of Inside F2. I'm your host, Fraser Ford, and joining me to review all of the action from Monte Carlo, we have Inside F2 writer Aaron Harper and motorsport journalist Sam Coop. Coming up on the show then... Vesti the bestie, we discuss Frederick's exceptional performance around the streets of Monaco. A dramatic feature race with a few near misses, as we've already mentioned. We discuss some of the controversial incidents this weekend. And we talk about the winners and the losers in the championship battle. But before all of that, Sam, first time with us on the podcast. A big welcome to you. Uh, Lots to sink our teeth into after another dramatic weekend of Formula 2 racing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm very excited. Looking forward to it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's F2 in Monaco. Uh, it's exactly what we were expecting, really, in that sense. But yeah, it was a. Uh, it seemed like it was simmering away, and then all of a sudden, high drama. So, yeah, plenty to get on with. Yeah, Aaron, agree with that. Not a shortage of things to talk about on uh, this episode of the F2 show by Insert F2, is there? No, there was uh, the red. A uh, sight of a red flag. I mean, I, I kind of thought about it heading into the weekend because we've seen the red flag fly a lot more often. But obviously, the accident for Jack Doohan necessitated a red flag, and it brought up that question of can they change tyres in the pit lane? Turns out they can. So some drivers benefited from that. Some drivers uh, less so. <laughs> they definitely did, and we're going to get into that uh, in a lot more detail very shortly. But let's start with our feature race winner, Frederick Vesti, our new championship leader and the championship leader for the first time in his career as well. A great lap on Friday, which I guess set him up for, for that wet race win on Sunday, Sam. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, it was obviously, starting qualifying, it was clinical when he needed to be, got the lap together and, yeah, comfortable and, uh, yeah, kept it clean. Exactly what you kind of, kind of needed Vesti to start working on because qualifying has always been a little bit of a uh, a weakness for him or an area that he needed to improve upon. Yeah, definitely. It was a really good performance by him, wasn't it? And Aaron, Frederick Vesti was voted by the fans as Inside F2's driver of the round. Any arguments with that? I mean, it was, as Sam's already said, a pretty clinical performance, particularly on Sunday, wasn't it? Can't argue with that at all because uh, I was one of those that voted for Fred Vesti. <laughs> so, um, he he did the job. The, the job you need to do when you go to any race in Monaco is take pole position and get out of Sandovat first. All of that came together for Fred and for Prima. So the job was pretty much done. And it was just about keeping concentration, staying out of the barriers. You know, obviously, and he, he eased away from the field Um especially from uh, Victor Martins in the early stages of the feature race. It was really, really strong uh, racecraft from, from Fred. And this is the Vessi that we wanted to see last year, but obviously first year in, in Formula 2. It does take some time to, to get up to speed. We do see we have these almost freakish drivers that turn up like Piastri and Russell. They bounce through Formula 3. They take Formula 2 by storm. And before you know it, they're winning races in Formula 1. It doesn't quite happen like that for every driver and I think Vesti is showing that the second season is really important and Teo Porcher as well the third season all that experience is really coming together and that's why those two are at the top of the championship. Sam we've seen obviously Frederick Vesti and uh, Teo Porcher and Owasa really the three of them they're all winning races they've all pulled away a little bit at the top of the standings are we expecting those three to be the main title contenders for the rest of the season or do you think anyone else can get involved in that in that kind of battle as well i think it's fair to say that the three main title protagonists but we are still fairly early on in the year it's you know i'm going to use jack Doon, who we'll get onto as a case point because i think going into the season i certainly felt that he was a title favorite he's only i think you know it's you know 60 70 points back I think he's on 28, Vesti's on 89. But yeah, he can still get back in it, but he's got to do it soon. But again, you look at, you know, Zay Maloney, if Carlin can, if things can start clicking there, Dennis Hauger again, you, you'd expect big things from him as the season progresses. He's already got a win under his belt. So it's not just those three, but those are the three that will most likely, um, you know, cordon off that, that title fight as we kind of get into the summer. 
Yeah, Zane Maloney, we know how strong he can finish a season as well. So, uh, yeah, we'll yeah. count him out just yet. I guess then in addition to Frederick Vesti, the driver of the round, Pramer were also voted your team of the round. So a big well done to Pramer this weekend. Aaron, at the start of the feature race, uh, Victor Martins put an almighty chop on Teo Porsche, didn't he? Was that a little bit too aggressive or is that just hard racing and it may be proven a point a little bit as well? Uh, I think it was a tad too aggressive because I know they're not teammates in the same sense of Formula One sort of teammates, but they do race for ART. And if they get wiped out at the start, I don't think the bosses at ART are going to be too pleased with the driver that instigates it. Um, it did lead Teo Porcher to say he needs to be a bit more aggressive uh, with other drivers. And I think that caught Teo by surprise that, that Victor was, was so aggressive off the line. But from Victor Martin's point of view, I can see exactly why he did it. You need to cover off that inside line into turn one at Monte Carlo. We saw Fernando Alonso do it in the Formula One race later on. Okay, he was on hard tyres versus the guy in third, Ocon, on mediums. But the principle remains the same. You've got to have track position. And that, that's all they worry about. But obviously, it's Monte Carlo. If it goes wrong, it could go spectacularly wrong very, very quickly. They got away with it, so no harm, no foul. But I think Porsche will be noting that one for next time, their will to win on track. And you might see a little bit more aggression from Teo Porsche in the coming races. Yeah, I, th I think it's fair to say the theory was correct from Victor. Maybe the execution was a little bit too aggressive. But again, I, I like the the approach to that because Teo, yeah, third season, the more experienced driver at this level, but Victor Martins is, you know, older, has a wealth of experience himself. And I think it was kind of a, look, you know, I'm just, I'm not going to let you have this. You're not necessarily the, necessarily the team leader here. So yeah, it's, um, yeah, a sign of things to come for, for Victor potentially, because I don't think his points total at this, at this stage of the season is representative of the pace he has shown at points. Uh, but yeah, we are, I'm sure we'll dissect Victor Martins' this race uh, in a little bit. It's interesting you say about uh, Victor Martins not letting him have, let, let Porsche have like, the team leadership because the dynamic there is 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 strange. I think because you've got Teo Porsche, third season in Formula Two, race winner, championship challenger last year, and he's only what nineteen years old, and you've got Victor Martins who's in his early twenties, all that extra experience in terms of racing, but in his first year of Formula Two, it's it's. It's so weird, isn't it? But then, you know, like you say, Victor's got to put that mark on it and almost show, yeah, I'm just as experienced. I'm just as good as you, even if you've got more experience at this level of racing. Yeah, completely. And I think Victor Martins is a good case study for uh, the fact that there is no one way of going through the the, the junior system. You know, yeah, you get Oscar Piastri, who go, you know, back to back with titles. But Martins has taken his time and he's, been on from day from day one in F2 on the pace obviously he needs to bring the other elements together to start consistently scoring points but yeah he, he shows that you can immediately take it to someone as talented as Terry Borgette Definitely, and that's a fascinating battle that I'm sure is going to continue for the rest of the season. Uh, let's talk about uh, the let's 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 go into Jack Doohan's crash first. I think we'll break it down into multiple different uh, incidents. So Jack Doohan to start off with. First of all, really good to see Jack Doohan back at the front where he belongs. Uh, showed he had the pace this weekend, uh, but he did obviously that mistake uh, where he. Uh, hit the wall, and then that led to his crash later on on the next lap. That that could prove costly in terms of points lost, couldn't it, Sam? It could do. You know, looking back at what I was saying before, he's on twenty eight points. That would have been realistically forty that he would have been on because he dropped a net twelve there, and that's a, a, a big amount for him at this stage of the season. He hasn't looked comfortable until we got to in season testing, and that's really been the turning point for him in terms of being comfortable with the car. Uh, so he needs to capitalise every round. I think he needs to outscore Vesti, the championship leader, by six or seven points a round for the rest of the season, on average, to be in that championship fight. So it's a tall order, and he basically can't make many more mistakes like, than, than he has now uh, already. So, yeah, it's uh, he's got to get it together quick. But again, we know he can. 
Yeah, we know he can. I didn't know, uh, I haven't seen this mentioned uh, anywhere on, on Twitter or, or anywhere really, but Felipe, uh, sorry, Felipe Dragovic, that's last season. Uh, Enzo Fittipaldi um, obviously had that failure um, a few laps before. And Alex Jakes did mention in commentary about, you know, potentially some fluid being on the track. Do, do we think that's potentially what caused Jack Doohan to make that mistake uh, when, you know, just after the chicane? Uh, or do you think it's just a driver error, Sam, that he's, he's hit the wall there? Well, it looked like he, the initial impact they had was coming out of the swimming pool section, which is obviously a few corners on from where Enzo had his, his mechanical issue. So he would have been carrying that oil or whatever on those tires for a good few corners. So I'm, I'm, I think realistically, it was probably just a lapse in concentration. Mm. You know, going around Monaco, it's it's a unique challenge on the calendar. Yes, there are the street circuits and plenty of them in F2, but it's such a different challenge in the sense that you're probably not going to overtake. You you need to force errors, but you also need to be really, really con- you know, concentrating well. And you know, one mistake, you're done. And yeah, I think that's really probably what it was for Jack. Yeah, big shame, isn't it? Um, Aaron, how on earth did Zane Maloney miss uh, Jack Dewan's car? That was very close, wasn't it? Very close, which could have led to a really nasty incident. I'm going to put it down to 50% skill and 50% pure luck because it's such a a lottery. It's a blind entry into Massonet, which is bad enough as it is. And then a car stranded... Uh, horizontally on the racing line and also about to catch fire. I mean, if if Zane makes contact there, obviously the potential escalation of the drama that's unfolding is, uh, you know, doesn't really bear thinking about. Also, we didn't know that at the time until they, they repaired the barrier, the barrier was damaged. If Zane had lost control and hit the same part of the barrier again, problems. So, Everyone did very, very well to get round there in the immediate aftermath. So credit to Zane Maloney, and I think it was might have been Richard for sure who was behind him. So yeah. credit to those two for having their wits about them to react and and drive appropriately around that accident because it's different if you if you encounter it under yellow flags as we're going to come to a little bit later on. You should expect to find something, but. At that point, necessarily the yellow flags will have only just come out. You're not sure quite what's happened. You're going to be reacting on the fly. So they've done really, really well to to get through there. And obviously, it was good that Jack Doohan got out of the car in time. Nothing hit him while he was in the car and nothing hit the car while it was stationary. So a, f- a fortunate miss, but also credit to the driver's skill for navigating that situation. Well, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned the flags, Aaron, because I don't know if you noticed on the on the broadcast, but the Marshall station directly behind Doohan, or on the other side where he hit the wall initially, that was waving, the Marshall was waving a green flag. Yeah. And yeah, technically it was past the point of the accident, but you're coming up the, the hill, there's yellow flags, and then all of a sudden you then see the next thing is a green flag with a car on the inside that's probably not sighted at that point. So I don't know. Obviously, I've never raced an F2 car. I've never raced any car. Uh, but that could potentially have had a, had a, an effect there for, for Zane. So I felt that maybe that probably should have been a yellow flag from that Marshall point. Yeah, you've got to factor in as well. They, they, they'd probably be using a crane in that sort of area. We saw, uh, I, I'm not sure whose car it was in practice. Someone had spun and then and lost the engine. Um, and they craned it off 100 feet in the air, you know, as they do in Monaco, showing everyone everything underneath the car. Um, so that's probably where the crane would have come from. So, yeah, you can have marshals coming from that area and things like that. So, yeah, I think you're right that the, the placement of the flagging needs to be potentially looked at there, making sure it's like a, enough space covering, if that makes sense, um, on the on the zone of the accident. Definitely. Uh, glad they're both okay. Obviously, Jack Doohan and Zane Maloney, obviously Richard for sure as well. I'm also glad the Marshalls are okay because, Sam, Victor Martins came so, so close to hitting a Marshall uh, that was recovering Jack Doohan's car at Massonet, didn't he? Um, yeah, what did you make of that? And I know we, we exchanged a few tweets on Twitter about whether the, the penalty that he received was uh, suffice for that kind of incident. Uh, yeah, what were your thoughts on that? Well, initially I thought, well, that's, you know, because this is before we'd seen the incident, it comes through drive-through penalty. You think, God, that's 
well, yeah, he must have done something pretty serious. Then you see the the incident, and you go, arguably, pr- pretty pretty light. It could have been more severe for him. And I think often when we talk about drivers not slowing under double yellows, which, yeah, as uh, as I'm sure the listeners know, is you know reduce your pace dr- drastically and be ready to stop. And he wasn't. Let's face it. And yeah, often when we talk about it there isn't that danger there isn't someone on the track so it's kind of academic in that point but this could have had real implications it, yeah it was it was a dangerous incident i think he's lucky the marshal more lucky uh, for you know just doing doing their job and looking back at the the first lap incident or his over aggressive move i think he was potentially running a bit hot was knowing that he needed a solid result and obviously, I can't speak for him. I can't, you know, get in his head, get in his head in that sense. But yeah, a, a real lapse of judgment from him. It was absolutely a horror, sort of almost the worst case scenario you could see as an on board, uh, as a fan watching motorsport. And there was a Sam. You said you were surprised initially at the the severity of the penalty. And we were chatting in Discord um, on the inside of two general chat and. Um, some others were, were surprised at it immediately. My instant reaction to it was, you're speeding on a safety car. There's there's no excuse for that. Everyone has a, a Delta. It comes up on the um, on the on the dash on the car. There's no excuse for exceeding it. And then when I saw it, I actually felt it's borderline black flag. It was that yeah. bad. I mean, I, I don't want to see drivers disqualified, but I I thought it was it was that bad. Yeah, and I think it's one of those things where, and I, I said on Twitter. Victor won't make that mistake again and I hope the rest of the field and I hope and I'm glad that, that it's kind of been widely shared because Alice Powell who you know also associated with, associated with Alpine she commented on it um I think hopefully the racing community and the young drivers in the formula system can learn from it as well so that you know this sort of thing doesn't happen again and they go right you know no we really do need to take this seriously these rules are there for a reason completely agree um aaron should should it have been red flagged as soon as jack Dewan's car caught fire and obviously i know it subsequently was red flagged after uh that we we know that knew that the barriers were, were damaged but should it have been red flagged straight away because we knew marshals were going to be on the track and it avoids that situation or can you not really i guess if you do that you're setting a, a precedence for every round of the season right but yeah what were your thoughts on that Possibly without the barrier being broken, they could have navigated it under safety car because there was space around the outside of the circuit at that point for the cars to go around the outside safely at low speed uh, while the marshals did their job. I mean, they could have slowed down around the back of the track out by the seafront, allowed them to remove the car, come back around, avoid the, all the, the mess from the fire extinguisher, dry that out. You know, we might lose three, four, maybe five racing laps, but everyone's safe. In the end, the red flag was absolutely the right decision to to take because you had the barrier damage and you had water and extinguisher all over the, the racetrack on the racing line. At that, that part of the track, you basically needed wet tyres. So um, it was the right decision. Be nice if they sped that process up and were a bit more snappy with it, but then you don't. You don't also don't want to have needless red flags where they go, oh, red flag. And then you realize, oh, actually, no, it's not as bad as we thought. So it's it's a fine balance. And hopefully that that point will come some point in the future. But ultimately, the right call was made and everybody eventually was safe. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Aaron. You can't de-escalate from a red flag. Once you've thrown the red, that's it. Whereas you can obviously escalate after you know bringing out the safety car. So from that perspective, I think they're absolutely right. I think it took too long. I think yeah, it's an evolving dynamic situation. And as they worked out that actually, no, this is more serious, that's when it happened. But I think that sometimes the delay that we see now is because there's so much scrutiny. Social media is so prevalent and there's so much attention on the performance of race stewards. You know, we've seen that the last couple of years, they, they can't make an error or, or it's perceived that they can't make an error. So they've really got to be bulletproof on the, on that front and in terms of obviously monaco's very very different and there were drivers as we saw you know zane and, and richard coming through you know you, you need to be careful but take baku for example when they let the drivers race on because everyone was clear of the the actual incident on the restart both 
Oliver, Oliver Berman and Fred Vesti said, we actually didn't mind it. Even Fred Vesti, who lost the win because of the delay in calling the safety car, he was like, yeah, it allowed us to race for a little bit longer. Fair play to Ollie. So, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, using it, the discretion in the right points, you know, in the right times. And I think this weekend it was right, just a little bit too long. Yeah. No, I agree with both of you guys. And I know a few people, well, a lot of people on social media also agree. And um, we then had the restart after the red flag. The stewards opted to go for a rolling start. Uh, that uh, obviously allowed uh, lap cars to overtake as well. Uh, however, the rolling start did mean that there was a 56 second gap between Roman Stanner in P8 and Jack Crawford in P9 when we resumed racing. Should we have gone with a standing start, Aaron, or was the rolling start the right decision? Uh, the rolling start was the right decision. So if you watched the Indy 500 last night, <laughs> the chaos that <laughs> ensued because of multiple red flags in the final phases of the race, they, they had, I think, one green lap, uh, from, lap from, from 18 laps to go. And uh, that was the final lap of the Indianapolis 500. So it's Monaco. We've already seen drivers being aggressive at the start. We've seen an accident at Massonet. The, the stakes are really high. You know, someone in the midfield is going to make a lunge when it's probably advisable not to, you know, not to single him out, but maybe Iwasa knowing I'm intent. I need as many points as I can because Vesti and Porsche are at the front. It goes for something brave, bold, and ultimately it's spectacularly wrong because it causes an accident. Australia earlier in the year, Formula One, it was just chaos. Um, so the rolling start, absolutely the right decision because if you if you don't do that, and standing starts are fun. I like them. It's that that drama, that anticipation of that showdown moment, but there's a time and the play and there's a time and a place for them. And Monaco is never the time and place for them. It's bad enough having to do it at the start of the race. So doing it with a handful of apps to go, it's just asking for trouble. I guess, though, what that means is that when Victor Martins did receive his penalty, he still finished in P8, receiving or still picking up four points. If that was a standing start, he would have been well outside the points, Sam. What's the what's the argument to that? Well, that's that's the thing, isn't it? It's until Victor was given that penalty, it was all fine. There was no issue with it because opting for the rolling start keeps it clean. It allows you to get that final, I think it was 25 minutes of, of running, which obviously kind of you know, adds further validity to the result when you're 24 laps for a 42 lap race. So that was fine. But when Jack Crawford in what ninth downwards is so far back because they haven't been able to catch up to the field after being released by the safety car, that allowed Victor to have a drive through penalty. And yeah, as you say, pick up points. So I think that needs to be looked at. I think maybe, but it's difficult, isn't it? Because you don't want to necessarily change the rules to try and fit certain scenarios. But yeah, ultimately, had they let the guys catch up to the field, it would have you you would have you would have avoided that situation. But in the rules, nothing says that they need to let the guys catch up. You just have to be released. So they did play it by by the rule book to their credit. So I think they did make the right call ultimately. I, I do feel sorry for the, the guys like Jack Crawford, Yumi Owasa, Oliver Behrman, Isaac Hadjar, all there potentially in with a shout of grabbing some points if they could have got close enough. They ended up 14 seconds behind Victor Martins at the flag. Um, but the stewards will justify it in that Victor Martins has been penalised for his, his transgression and he's lost a, a P2 and they turned that into a P8. So... For Martens, yeah, he's still come away with some points because he's driven well all weekend, barring one glaring error. Um, but it has cost him. So, you know, it, it it's difficult to judge things and then we can't make rules over circumstantial evidence. Um, but like you say, Sam, they followed the rules. There is no rule in them allowing them to come back round and catch up. That is probably just, you know, good etiquette on the part of race control, allowing them to do that. 
at that point, Victor Martin's penalty was still very much in review. So making your decisions about the race start because of that is kind of the tail wagging the dog. Moving forward, maybe they'll go, you know what, we'll sacrifice another lap to let, let everyone catch up. And I think that would have been perfectly fine because you're not going to get to the re- full race distance at that point anyway. What's another kind of minute and a half, two minutes? No, it's a good point because if you end up spending another five laps behind safety car conditions, the outrage on Twitter would be unbearable. So, uh, yeah, we uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's finding that middle ground, isn't it, for sure. Um, let's talk about our sprint race winner, Ayumu Awasa. I wouldn't say it was his best weekend, but he still comes away with a win in the sprint race, uh, points in both races. Uh, yeah, he's kind of doing everything he needs to do to keep himself in contention uh, for the championship, even on his bad weekends, isn't he, Aaron? He didn't qualify particularly well. And that's kind of how he ended up at the front in the sprint. Uh, he's got three wins this season. He's the most winning driver in Formula 2 this season, but two of them have been sprints and they only pay out 10 points for a win. Um, while Porsche, Behrman and uh, now Vesti have all got feature race victories. Uh, of course, Iwasa has got a feature race victory himself, but he's not had that underlying consistency to keep backing up his feature race victory. So if he can keep picking off these these uh, sprint race wins, then he'll keep himself in the fight, but he needs to qualify better. So he's scoring the bigger points on the Sunday because as good as a sprint race win is, it's actually worse than a fourth place in the feature race, which you know might not sound a great deal, but actually in the championship scheme of things, that ends up being more valuable to him because it's an extra two points, you know, potentially if there's some shenanigans ahead of him, podium, maybe even a feature race victory, depending on the circuit that we're at. He got a bit fortunate in that Isaac Hadjar uh, dropped out, but, you know, if you, the old phrase, if you don't buy a ticket, you don't win the prize. And he was in the pound seat to capitalise if anything happened to, put, to poor Isaac, <laughs> who was doing everything right at that point. And uh, yeah, Iwasa, he hit the jackpot. Yeah, completely. And I think he needs to kind of draw upon what Felipe Drogovic was able to do last year, where he identified those weekends where I'm not going to win. And that's fine. I'm, I can't go for broke every weekend. But in those on those weekends, Felipe was still qualifying fifth, sixth, seventh, and bringing home a solid haul of points. And that's what Iwasa needs to do for the rest of the season. On those weekends where he can't win is in the feature race is do that. And I think you, you saw that after qualifying this weekend. I think Baku was a, a lost cause uh, for him. He was so far back. But yeah, he. I think he is showing that maturity. He just needs to sew a whole weekend together more consistently. Uh, and still my favourite for the title at this point now. I've, 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 moved, I've moved off Jack because I think he's a long way back. I think he'll still win the conversation. But I think Awasa is less likely to make mistakes. But I think he needs to... I think the other two, when they shine bright, they shine brighter um, on those weekends. But Oasa, I think if he can reach that level of consistency or heighten his level of consistency, I think, yeah, he could easily claw back and and be a real problem for Vesti and Porcher. That is an interesting shout from Sam Coop. Awasa, still your favourite for, for the title. Very interesting. An average of 14 points per weekend this season for Awasa so far. And we know our consistency is key in Formula 2. Speaking of consistency, only three drivers so far this season have uh, managed to pick up points in every single round. Aaron, can you name those three drivers? Or not necessarily all of them, but uh, yeah, give, give it a go. Who, who scored points in every single round this season? Uh, I'm throwing you on the spot Kush, here really bad aren't Kush Miney <laughs> Kush Miney is one Kush Miney yeah I want to say Richard for sure but I'm not sure that's Richard is it for Richard sure? for sure um, Sam feel free to jump in if you know it's the not, first it's not Vesti because he didn't score in Bahrain it might is it Porsche no nope. I don't think it's Porsche no. I think it's Dennis Hauger. It is indeed Dennis Hauger, and that guys is superb the free, uh, yeah to get those three names between the two of you Kush Marnie, Dennis Hauger, and Richard Vashaw, the only drivers to score in all three rounds, uh, sorry, in every round uh, this, this season, which is pretty incredible given that the average qualifying position for each of those, Marnie is ninth, 
Hauger is 10th and Vashore is 11th, if my stats are right. Uh, they're average qualifying for this season and they've scored points in every single round. So, yeah, uh, consistent uh, consistency uh, is key in Formula 2 and they are the three who have scored points in every round so far this season. And yes, I know, I need to get a life rather than sitting around working out Formula 2 stats. I, uh, I know. <laughs> Um, let's move it on then. Um, Isaac Hadjar, quick word on him, Sam. So unlucky in the sprint race to, uh, yeah, we, I thought he was going to pick up his, his first win there. Um, but yeah, not, didn't quite work out, did it? It didn't. It was really unfortunate for him because Monaco is the place that if you, yeah, if you can take the lead through, you know, through the first corner, all you need to do is keep it facing the right way. No mechanical issues. And it just wasn't his day. And I think that would have been a real um, kind of getting over the hump a little bit. He's got points. He's, you know, ha- had some good results. But I, yeah, I feel, I, I do feel for him. And whenever something happens, I just, I, I'm waiting for the team radio because it still haunts me. The, uh, I think it was Monza when he put it in the wall in qualifying that, oh, he was so upset. And it was, I, yeah, it, it's heartbreaking for him because he is very, very quick. But he's also very, very young. He's got time. He doesn't need to worry. He doesn't need to rush things. He he just needs to settle into F2. And I think next year he will come on significantly stronger than he, than he has so far. Yeah, completely agree there. His teammate, Aaron, three podiums in the last three, three sprint races. He's uh, having a, a quietly good season, would you say? Progressing well? Kind of going under the radar, isn't he, Jack Crawford? So, I mean, he... he, he picked up a podium again in in Monaco. You've got to be there. You've got to be in it to win it. Like I said earlier, if you've got a ticket, you can win the prize. And he's putting himself in positions to pick up those podiums. I think they're all in sprint races. Um, He might have a feature race one. um, If I just look at Yeah, all sprint races. All sprint races. All sprint races, yeah. So they're not paying out as many points. But, you know, podium's a podium at the end of the day. He gets to go up there and are they old enough to spray champagne? <laughs> this lot? I don't know. They're all so young. I I queried this with Baku. Oli Behrman and Jack Crawford were still, I think it was a good like a week or so away from turning 18. Yeah. So kind of, you know, I'm sure we'll give them a you know, give them a pass. The drinking age in Azerbaijan was 18. Uh, I, I I did look it up um as well. Uh but yeah, uh, again, but that highlights the age of some of these guys uh, and they're just, you know, the future of F2 for the next two or three years is look is is strong. It's looking really, really promising. Are we expecting a bit of a shift in momentum as we move to more traditional circuits? Or are we expecting it to be the same top three competing for race wins over the next few rounds? I think you're going to see the usual ebb and flow. I think we're going to see the likes of Vesti and Porsche, Prima and ART at the front. Iwasa, if he can reach that level of consistency across a weekend and qualify well enough, He'll be in there as well. But there's a lot of drivers that we've mentioned. Zane Maloney, Dennis Hauger, Oli Behrman, Jehan Daravala. When he when he's on form, he's capable of putting a race winning performance together. All of the basically anyone in the field can win a Formula Two race. So if they get the setup right, if the team is on form, if the driver's on song, it can all come together. But I do think we might see Vesti and Porsche now pull away. Iwasa might go with them. And anyone in the pack behind, so talking of Jack Doohan, Dennis Hauger, Oli Behrman, if they want to put a serious title challenge together, they've got to do a Felipe Drogovic. They've got to win both races in Spain. They've got to go and put a run together where they win two out of six or seven races across three or four rounds. And they've got to take pole positions. And that's those extra bit of points for pole and fastest lap, they're going to make a difference. So whoever puts that run together He's going to be a really, really strong position going forward. But it is still, even though Vesti and Porsche are edging clear, still very open. Yeah, absolutely. And Aaron, you talk about you know putting a run together. This is the time that we often see guys do that, is through June heading into July. July is always a packed schedule uh, in F2. So that's when momentum is really generated. Porsche generated some really good momentum last year and it all fell apart over the, the triple header after the summer. But for me... I'm looking at MP Motorsport to be strong in Barcelona. They know a lot, you know, clearly got things right last year. I think they won a race the year before in Barcelona. So Hauger for me is the one who's most likely to kind of break away from that kind of trailing group 
Kushmani's been a revelation. He's been fantastic. But I think Campos, a year or two away from being able to sustain um, a, a, a title charge, uh, you know, we've seen Ralph Boschong have some really good weekends. But again, he's probably too far back or not able to bring that level week in, week out. Uh, so yeah, for me, Dennis Hauger is definitely one to watch next weekend. Okay, let's take a look at the championship standings after Monaco then. Frederick Vesti takes the championship lead for the first time in his career after winning the duel in the crown. It remains tight at the top though, with Theo Porcher just five points behind. Kushmani, as we've just mentioned, is the highest placed rookie after more points this weekend. Good weekends for Dennis Hauger and Zane Maloney mean they gain places as well. And Arthur Leclerc rounds out the top 10. And the team standings? Bremen remain 22 points clear at the top of the team standings after their third feature race victory of the season. ART move ahead of Dan's into second. A good weekend for Carlin means they, re- they close to within three points of the top five. And PHM remain the only team yet to score. Okay, before we go, Sam, talk to us a little bit about where else we can find you. So I am the editor-in-chief of Formula Nerds. Um, if you don't know us, check us out on socials. Um, on Twitter, is Formula underscore nerds. Um, I, we have a podcast as well. Uh, don't cover F2 so much, but if you like F1 as well, check out the Cut to the Race podcast on Spotify. We also do a midweek news show called News from the Nerds to keep you updated with all the news from the world of F1. Definitely go and check it out. Really good podcast and really good. Yeah, Formula Nerds is brilliant. So, uh, yeah, listen to Formula Nerds for Formula One content and listen to Inside F2 for Formula Two content as well. (laughs) Uh, Aaron, where can we find you as well uh, other than Inside F2? Uh, So you can find me, obviously, writing for Inside F2, but I do my own show, uh, Aaron Harper Grand Prix. So it's just a podcast, it's a YouTube channel where I do a a variety of videos, uh, shorts, uh, last week for the Monaco Grand Prix, I let a wheel spinner give me the podium, which uh, produced Alex Albon winning the race and Joe Guan Yu also getting a podium. So we're going to do a bit more of that this week for Spain. Um, yeah, so come and join me there. I do sort of race reactions and I do a little bit of IndyCar, a little bit of Formula E, Formula E watch along. So I just sort of share my love for motorsport on that channel. Lovely stuff. Okay, that's all we got time for today. My thanks to Sam and to Aaron for joining us on today's show. If you've enjoyed the show, as always, please make sure you go and give it a like and subscribe to hear more Formula 2 content and get involved in the conversation as well over on our social media channels. We always love hearing your thoughts and opinions. But from me, Fraser Ford, and all of us here at Inside F2, we'll see you next time.